Hello, everybody. It's Friday. It is noon uh, Pacific time, and, and that is time for Relentless Learning. Uh, it's something we do as a LinkedIn live event uh, every Friday. Um, and uh, for the next 45 minutes, um, I'm going to present a guest. We're going to talk about uh, a couple big ideas. And um, just briefly, before we get started, let me talk a little bit about <clears throat> Relentless Learning uh, itself, which is sponsored by something called the VUCA MBA. Uh, this week, my special guest is Charlie Triplett. He's going to present on di digital accessibility. Um, and um, I'm going to present on uh, how we see things being uh, primary to uh, how we experience the world. And, and uh, it makes a big uh, difference on how we perceive the world. Next week, I'm going to have Dan Moody with uh, with me. He's going to talk about uh, success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. Uh, and I'm going to talk on something <clears throat> that I'm very interested in, which I'm going to refer to as the counterintuitive nature of knowledge work. So I hope you can join us next week. Uh, for those of you who have not joined us before or might have forgotten, uh, this is sponsored by the VUCA MBA. As you can tell, we've got all kinds of... Uh, uh, VUCA MBA uh, logos and, and, and references in here. What is the VUCA MBA? VUCA is a term that came to us from the military some years ago to describe the world we live in, which is uh, increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. There are other acronyms that I've seen um, that would kind of describe it as well, but I think that this one has been around the longest and, and it still applies. Uh, and the MBA is uh, doesn't stand for Masters of Business Administration. It stands for Mindset for Business Agility. It's a little play on words there. So <clears throat> the key is uh, the, the VUCA MBA is for companies uh, who will bring me in to speak with them with this uh, curriculum that I've put together over the years that has been very well received. If you saw the opening, uh, if you came early, you saw some of the testimonials from people. Uh, other thing I want to promote while I have time today, uh, because it's just recently happened, is I have published over the years uh, uh, some small books. Um, these aren't big books. They're very easy to read. Uh, I believe this one weighs in at about 40 pages. But this is the most recent one. Uh, just published a couple of weeks ago. It's called AppKey's Golden Rule of Agile, a focus on value delivery. Uh, it is something that I came up with just recently in my career, which I'm referring to the golden rule of agile um, and a book about it and how we as individuals and companies can use this very simple concept to deliver the optimal value um, to our customers or, or achieve the optimal value in our lives uh, in the shortest amount of time. So uh, it's I think very exciting for me um, and uh, joins the the other two small books. You can find it on uh, Amazon Kindle. And we also have paperbacks through Lulu Publishing. I'm looking forward to getting my copy as well. I have put into the comments, I think that you folks all have access to that, uh, some links that are helpful if you want to get a hold of me. If you want to know more about the VUCA MBA, uh, if you want to get on the Relentless lo uh, Learning mailing list so that um, I'm not going to spam you with a bunch of stuff, but I'll send you some reminders and tell you who's coming and, and make sure that you get it on your calendar. Um, I have a lot of videos on YouTube that show some of the training that I've done. And there's even a link to my calendar. And uh, you can set up a Zoom chat with me. Love to talk with you. I'm very uh, obviously excited and enthusiastic about the work that I do. Um, and I believe that it is valuable and helpful for individuals and organizations. But that's one thing that I've learned as I've uh, started promoting this, that the, the class itself um, is not a class for individual consumers. It's a class for companies that would bring me in to do the work, though uh, I am considering potentially doing a, a consumer class. Um, so more to come on that if uh, something we decide to do. This week, I'm going to present my big idea. Then I'm going to I'm going to introduce Charlie. We're going to talk a little bit, and then he's going to present his big idea on uh, accessibility. He'll explain it better. So hopefully, I don't say anything wrong. My big idea this week is is how we see and how we perceive the world. 
This is part of uh, a lecture or, or a talk that I've just started giving uh, called Seeing Your Way to uh, a Successful Agile Transformation. Um, if there are people who are interested in that particular talk, um, there's actually a, a one in, a, I think, an hour, an hour and a half video um, that's on uh, my uh, YouTube page that has the complete talk. Today, I just want to talk about a very small part of that um, because I only have 10 minutes. We, we, we want to have one big idea in 10 minutes. I, I believe over the years, and I've been doing this now for about a dozen years, trying to help companies transition and transform into what we would consider more agile companies. And what I've found um, through practice and what I've also found through, I would guess, uh, hazard to say is is um, some of the reading and things I've done, some of the research that I've done, is that I believe that perception is the real key. How we see the world is a real key. And uh, this slide here is just basically saying that um, all of these th these things are are interrelated. Perception, how we see the world thinking how we think about the world and behaving, how we actually navigate through the world. They're all related. Um, but I think the real key is the perceiving part, because I think what most people know, uh, even though this is, I think, intuitive, they tend to gloss over the perception piece. In a lot of cases, they tend to gloss over even the thinking piece and they move straight into the behaving piece. And if you look at most, this is this is why I believe my training is, is, is different and somewhat unique, because I concentrate a lot on that top left, that perception, whereas most trainings, if you go take uh, and maybe it's changed, but I, I took it years ago. You take something like a certified scrum master class. We'll spend a lot of time on the behaving. Um, what do we do? Not do what do we think or not what do we see. So I'm going to spend more time on the perceivings because for a big reason is because I believe that perceiving leads to thinking. I'm not the first person to make this observation. I think uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Buddhist philosophy. I think this is in, in, in line with Buddhist philosophy. What we perceive or see in the world leads to what we think about the world and how we think about the world uh, relates to how we behave in the world and how we uh, behave in the world leads to how we perceive, and these things are all kind of wound up. And we can change the way we think and perceive by changing the way we behave, but I don't think that's the best way. And I think that's the way most transformations do. So that's just my opinion, but this is based on a lot of experience. And as I said before, if you agree with me that perception leads to thinking, thinking leads to behaving, and, and we want to change behavior, what we really need to start with, the basis of it is perception. And most agile transformations and ones that I've been involved with and ones where I've learned about what I think will work and won't work, concentrate mostly on behaving. And I think it's even if you look at the, the, the Agile Manifesto, which I'm a huge fan of, I wrote a, a book about, um, the values and principles, I think, are more about thinking and perceiving than they are necessarily the behaving. Um, we do have to change, obviously, our behavior, but how do we get there? And why, to me, is how we see things so critical? Because in what I've learned about evolution, human evolution, especially human uh, kind of mental evolution, uh, brain evolution, is we've evolved in ways that do not allow us to perceive the world optimally. And that's easy enough to prove, and, and I'll show you a few quick examples. Um, but we've also evolved, for whatever reason, a blindness to our perception issues, or, or even you might want to say a blindness to our blindness. Um, and that is a problem. We tend to think that what we perceive is real, and that is, that is all there is. But we, we also know that it's not true. And it's easy to perceive, it's easy for these perception problems because if I look at this particular, uh, uh, what do you call it, slide um, here, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing optical illusions. My brain is, is, is being tricked and it's easily tricked. Um, the one on the top left is one of my favorites because if you look at, and maybe it's hard for you to see, 
some of the squares that are in shadow, um, they are the same as some of the squares that look white. So some of the uh, squares that are gray are, are actually the same color as the ones that are white because we have evolved to perceive depth even when there is no depth because these are obviously two-dimensional images, right? They're not three-dimensional, but we see in 3D. So the tables are the same size. When we have something that is against something that is large, it looks smaller and vice versa. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. We're easily deceived in sight. And the problem with being deceived in sight and how we see things, which is our primary, for those of us who have uh, good sight in Charlotte, we talk about, uh, obviously, uh, folks who don't and, and how we give them uh, accessibility to things. But for those of us who do have sight, this is our primary sense. We have a lot of neurons that are associated with it. And if we have problems with that, the question is, what happens in places where we don't, haven't evolved such good systems of perception. And this is a quote from Dan Ariely. Uh, for those of you who don't know Dan Ariely, he, he wrote some wonderful books. Um, uh, in, uh, he's a behavioral economist down at Duke University. Uh, one of the more famous books he wrote is Predictably Irrational. He says in, in one of his uh, TED Talks, he says, look, if we have problems with vision, which is supposed to be the thing we're best at. What happens when we get into things that are that are much more complex just to, than, than seeing things? What happens when we have to make economic decisions? What happens when we need to make decisions in a complex or, or dare I say VUCA world? Are we going to be able to perceive things correctly? Or are we going to be able to make good decisions? The answer is that we often don't. And this kind of is a foreshadowing to next week when I'm going to talk about the what I call the counterintuitive nature of knowledge work. We don't see things as they are, and this is very problematic. And this is the this is the last slide and kind of the last bit of this, what I'm going to refer to as the big idea of how we see the world is is so important. We don't necessarily perceive the world we see, we see the world that our senses allow us to perceive. None of us can see things as they are. We don't see things as they are. This, this, is, this is scientific. This is not just because I, I want to be contrarian. We see things as we are. We see things based on our experience. We see things based on our biases. Uh, and some of us have biases that are in common. That's certainly something I talk a lot about. And I'm sure uh, we'll talk about in one of these Friday sessions. Uh, Edgar Schein, we do not think and talk about what we see, we see what we are able to think and talk about. And Max Planck, um, who, who, who says, uh, you know, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So to me, when we're looking at transformation as human beings, when we're looking to change our behavior, I think the most successful way to do so is first change the way we perceive the world, change the way we see the world. And then we will change the way we think about the world and we'll change the way we behave in it. All those things obviously are, are, are interrelated, um, but I wanna emphasize the fact that in most people's lives, I think we don't spend enough time changing how we see things in order to, 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 to change um, uh, our behavior. So that's my big idea. I want to uh, bring to the stage uh, my friend Charlie. There he is. He's been very patient sitting in the green room. Um, Charlie, the, the wonderful thing about me being able to do uh, a, a, a kind of a little show like this, and I appreciate you folks for, uh, who, who, for the folks who showed up today, is I get to bring on some friends and people that I've worked with or people that I've known through the years, and Charlie is one of them. Um, Charlie is a champion of inclusive UX design and UI engineering and focused on digital accessibility for people with disabilities. Uh, he's been doing this for 20 years and he's learned uh, to create accessible products that everyone can use, which leads to uh, greater business gains. Um, and he applies uh, a, a approach to mentoring teams to help them unlock innovation by making sure that they create things that are more perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, and 
He invented and open sourced uh, MagentaAlly.com, a tool that unlocks accessible expertise for everyone. Um, he's written a book on uh, accessibility, um, which he can talk a little bit about. Um, and uh, he's very talented in this respect. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of respect for Charlie. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's an honor to, to call him a friend. He lives up in uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, and uh, enjoys hiking, uh, canoeing, and good coffee. What well, that makes sense up in Seattle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, you know, uh, when in Rome. Um, well, thank you for that intro, Larry. I really appreciate that. Yeah, of course. And, and when we bring on guests, um, one of the things that we do is obviously want to give you a good send off before your big idea but we also want to talk about some of the things that are kind of near and dear to your heart the things that you're working on now maybe you have some things to promote like your book and other things um what's going on with you these days that folks should know about oh you know um right now i'm really focused on um a few things but probably the the most relevant thing for this group really is the the book on accessibility.com um it is a operations manual for setting up an accessibility program and really creating an organization that can put inclusion at the beginning of its processes in the digital space rather than trying to uh, audit them to perfection later uh, which you, you just can't do mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really trying to to bring that content to as many people as i can uh through through events like this but um uh, also, just through some some uh, speaking engagements and some workshops I'm doing uh, next year. Um, that's what's keeping me busy right now. Well, that that and uh, a leaky hot water heater. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do is is I don't know if the folks who are who are paying attention we we can't actually interact in the in the comment section. You all can, um, and we want you to. So if you have questions, you can put them in the comments. I put the little banner down there at the bottom to remind you. Um, and I think, Charlie, if you could, after we're done here and we're no longer live, you'll have access to this. If you might want to put in the comments some of the stuff so that the, the people who see this later, not live, but the people who have seen it live will have access to some of the things that you're talking about. I think that would be awesome. Um, yeah, you're probably sure. going to present it in your in your in uh, some of that in your presentation probably as well. Um, the presentation, talk to me just briefly before we get here and I'm going to get out of the way and, and, and let you have the stage and, you, and, and you're going to take over in a second here. But talk a little bit, just kind of set up this presentation uh, on digital accessibility. And, and the, the thing that's most fascinating to me, I think there's two things that are fascinating. One is <clears throat> you're saying, look, this is something that is good for business. This is not a cost center. This is a revenue center, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And second thing is you're talking about how to build it into the system and make sure that it happens as opposed to kind of trying to uh, inspect it into the system after the fact. So these two things are really intriguing to me. Want to say a little bit more before we get going? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, who is it who said uh, you can't inspect your way to quality? No, Deming is one of the ones that says that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, you know, b before we really dive in, I do want to make sure we're on the same page about what accessibility means. Okay. Um, there are generally four broad categories of disabilities and when we're talking about the digital space. So there's uh, motor, hearing, uh, vision, and, and cognitive uh, disabilities that we're concerned about in the digital space. And so when we're talking about people with motor disabilities, so that means that someone is not necessarily able to, you know, use a mouse um, because they, they have mobility issues or they can't tap on a touch screen. And folks like that will use specialized technology, uh, either something as simple as a keyboard or something that's very highly customized, like what's called a switch device, which can often look more like a game controller than a keyboard mm -hmm. or a normal input device. They might be using voice control to control their machine by just speaking to it. Uh, people who are blind or low vision, um, they can't see and perceive everything that's happening on screen. So they use applications that are called a screen reader and that reads what's happening live on the screen to them. So if you are going through an application and you're, you're paying your phone bill or whatever that is, it's reading to you what's appearing on the screen so that you can interact with it. 
Mm -hmm. And that's where that that perceivable, operable, understandable and, and robust comes in. You know, in order to interact with that, whether you're sighted or not, you have to perceive what's going on. You have to be able to operate the, the interface and understand it. And it needs to be robust because it needs to work on a on a smartphone. It needs to work on my desktop. It needs to be everywhere. It needs to be mm -hmm. really, really well built. Um, Probably the, the assistive technology that most people are familiar with in the disability space is captions. So people who are deaf or hard of hearing, they will turn on captions so they can consume video um, without the audio. Uh, and when we're talking about cognitive disabilities, there's a wide range of things that we can do to help people navigate and understand you know, simple to complex processes. So there, there's a wide gamut of things we can account for and um, my belief is that when we do that, we make better products for everybody. That's great. I agree, Charlie. I know you've got something to present, so I'm going to I'm going to jump out of the way um, and, and let you have that. I think you can take over the, the, the thing. We'll make sure that the technology is working for us. Yeah, let me share my screen. Let me know if you can't see it. All right. So we should be seeing accessibility is the next big UX innovation. Here we go. Let's get started. Uh, here's the deal. Long story short, I have repeatedly seen that accessibility is the path to innovation, especially in the UX and UI space in the digital world. Um, but what I want to talk about today is why that is and where innovation really comes from. Um, innovation is such a buzzword right now. Um, you know, before AI took everything over, uh, it was it was innovation, and now it's AI innovation. We want machine learning innovation, but it feels like every leader in every space is talking about how their company is is innovative, and they hire innovators, and they want people who are innovative. But if there's all this innovation floating around in the world, why is so much of our software that we use so bad? Um, so. Let me explain why I get excited about accessibility. It is not a goody goody, you know, feeling for me. I'm not an activist sort of person. I'm a very technical, competitive designer and engineer. The best way I can explain this is to talk to you for a little bit about race cars. Okay. I promise I'm going to talk about accessibility for, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, for all those watching, I want you to think about what would make you nervous about this car. If I ask you to race around this car in an old dirt track at top speed, engine just, just wailing, what would make you nervous about that? How comfortable would you be with that, okay? Uh, how about that lack of a roll cage, all right? The, the gas tank sitting right behind the driver, those wheels really feel like they grip the road, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not sure that that helmet is really gonna prevent like a traumatic brain injury. I'm not sure that that bomber jacket is like really flame retardant. You know, this car was not built with the driver's safety as the top priority, okay? Like she is not safe in that car. Um, when we're talking about building race cars and racing environments, we're, we're, we're talking about extreme use case. And I love that word, extreme use case. Now, I don't like the word edge case. This is an extreme use of technology. Um, that forces innovation to happen very, very quickly. Because you have people who want to get in this thing and drive really, really fast, but they also don't want to get hurt. Um, and so when you have that sort of situation, people start to innovate. They start to make innovative solutions to allow this to happen. Many of the features that we take for granted today in our passenger cars that we drive around in came from a racing environment. Okay, how does that happen? Uh, you know, the, the things like a roll cage that keeps us safe in the event of a rollover. Uh, our cars all have anti-lock brakes and sophisticated suspension systems. Uh, we have a rear view mirror. Look at this car, Larry. They have not even invented the rear view mirror yet. That's, that's how far back we're going in history. The rear view mirror was invented in racing because it was easier to look at the mirror to see where your competitors were rather than cranking your head all the way around. Makes sense. But here's the funny thing, though. I mean, nobody in the consumer market, nobody who was driving an old Model T or an old Oldsmobile back then was asking for anti-lock brakes and anti-sway bars. OK, nobody was asking for that. But they became features in everyday cars by transitioning from the racing environment to luxury cars. And then they end up in everyday passenger cars. Happens all the time. 
believe it or not, this happens today. So um, before I started uh, my design degree, um, I was actually studying mechanical engineering. And my college extracurricular was building solar powered race cars. And this is another extreme use case. You have a car that uh, uses very little energy, uh, about enough to run a small hairdryer. Uh, it has to operate at highway speeds. We drove this car from Chicago to LA. Um, and it doesn't have an air conditioner, but it does have a roll cage. It, the driver wore a helmet. It cornered very, very well. Uh, it had a rear video mirror system that worked very well so our driver could see what was going on around them. I bring this up um, because, as it turns out, many of the engineers that, start, that, that helped start Tesla were also building solar cars like this, uh, specifically Stanford. Um, from their team, the, many of those engineers ended up at Tesla. And that extreme use case tech made it into the consumer market because you had people who knew how to build things that didn't consume that much energy and worked differently enough to make electric vehicles possible. And now through that first very expensive Tesla and various sub models and through other brands, electric cars are everywhere. And that is how innovation reliably happens through extreme use case. We see it everywhere. It happens all the time, but you have to think about it as an extreme use case. Okay. So I want to be clear. I didn't always care about accessibility. Uh, early on in my design and engineering career, I was obsessed with this idea that we really wanted to be focused on the people in the middle of the spell curve, this, the so-called average user. I was obsessed that that was the right and most efficient thing to do. But as I began to adopt accessibility into my work, what I learned was is that the insights were on those sides of the bell curve, the extreme use cases. And really what was happening was is that the so-called average person or person I thought was average validated those insights. It happens all the time in my work. And Really, the idea of average people is, is a really bad idea because this is not about a few people. Um, 61, million, 61 million Americans have a disability. Uh, that's over a quarter of Americans. Um, this is not a small number of people. Uh, people with disabilities are the largest minority in the United States. And this number is only going to get bigger as our population ages. OK, so we talked about race cars, but let's bring it back to accessibility. So here's a solution you've seen out in the wild and you've probably used. Um, these ramps are cut into the curb. They're called a curb cut. And they're a good example of a simple, cheap feature that helps everyone. Uh, if I pointed to that and asked you what that's for, you'd say, oh, well, that's for someone using a wheelchair. But we all use it. Uh, who else uses it? Well, someone who's pushing a baby stroller or someone who has uh, has limited mobility because they they have a, uh, maybe they had knee surgery and they're just on crutches right now. Uh, someone who's just fixated on, uh, on TikTok is, is crossing the street and they're distracted. The curb cut is a feature made to help people with disabilities, but it actually helps everyone because everyone has the same goal, which is to travel from point A to point B. Now, Here's what's neat about the idea of accessibility in, in the digital space. Uh, we've had UI and UX revolutions before. When was the last big innovation in UI design and UX experiences? It was 2007 with the iPhone. Okay, the iPhone was released. And what was interesting was if you wanted to look at a website on the original iPhone, because there was no such thing as mobile first design, you had to like pinch and zoom and, and move around the website. It was very, very much like having a motor and vision disability because you had to zoom in, you, you had to very precisely tap buttons and it was hard. Um, in response, many companies built a separate mobile version, which was costly because we were maintaining two whole websites. And it wasn't only expensive to build and maintain, um, but those two versions couldn't learn from each other. Uh, in 2010, though, this is when things start to get interesting. In 2010, we began to start designing for mobile first. Okay, all of our all of our all of our design considerations when we were building apps, when we were building websites, we started with the smartphone. 
And what we learned was that the same design patterns that worked well on a small screen, like big buttons and larger text and just less complex operations, simplifying things and simplifying things and simplifying things for the customer, that worked really well on desktop too. Um, and the funny thing is, is that like if you are designing for mobile first, you are accounting for a lot of accessibility issues. I believe this is the big idea that accessible first design is just sitting here waiting to be the next UI innovation. This is the next big innovation from whence we can we can form the next revolution of UI design. And I'm excited about it. It's happening here and there. Um, because look, this is not just about people with disabilities. This is about everybody. We tend to think of disabilities as permanent or total. Uh, so someone who is totally blind or someone who is 100% restricted to using a wheelchair or someone who's completely deaf, but we all experience temporary or situational disabilities. Okay. So a few years ago I had knee surgery and I was on crutches. Uh, suddenly I had a temporary motor disability. Uh, if you've been drowsy from taking a medication, you have problems focusing, you have problems remembering things. That's like having a temporary uh, cognitive disability. If you have a small child or you have a dog or something that you're holding in your arm and you're still trying to use your phone, you're kind of reduced down to, you know, having one thumb and one hand with which to operate your device. You have a situational disability. And as our population in this country continues to age, these numbers are only going to get larger. So if I had to describe it in one slide, it's this little Venn diagram. If you, if you layered the things that fully able people want and the things that people with disabilities want, uh, this Venn diagram is practically a circle. There is only a thin sliver of things that people with disabilities and certain assistive technology need. Um, and there's only a thin sliver of things that fully able people want that disabled people don't care about, but largely, these two areas completely overlap. And when we put accessibility at the beginning of our processes, we make a better experience for everybody reliably every time. That's my big idea. What do you think, Larry? I think it's great, Charlie. I, I appreciate it. You know, as you're going through that, <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, um, my wife, Jana, is on a committee at her work um, for people who have uh, accessibility issues or disabilities and um i think it would be something that uh you know i'm, I'm hoping she's listening here and, and maybe she'll react you know she'll reach out to you because maybe it would be something that you could speak with to that group do you do you find yourself do you find people coming to you uh for speaking engagements like this from time to time and 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 if somebody's interested in doing that uh if they hear, hear us either live or uh, you know, later, um, uh, they, they happen upon this. Is that something that you do? Yeah, I've been doing a few webinars here and there. Um, I just did one on gaining leadership buy-in for building an accessibility program and how important it is to be able to leverage leadership buy-in and do that in a way that actually gets more than just a smile and a nod, but actually gets the results that you're looking for. Uh, I'm also doing a, uh, accessible design workshop in Portugal in May. Uh, so, uh, that that's going on. I have a few other things in the works, but this is the sort of thing I really enjoy doing is sitting down with teams and organizations and getting these ideas injected in, in a way that I, I think the best way to describe it is sometimes you, you have people within an organization that know the same things I know. They see it too, but having mm -hmm. someone from outside who's perceived as an expert can say the things that are so easily ignored from within the org. Um, so right. I, I really enjoy that process. Yeah, I, I mean, and I'm sure everybody's experienced that before, right? As an agile coach, sometimes people will listen to me if I'm an outsider, they won't listen as much if I'm an insider. Um, what do you see? Uh, obviously, it, it, it's, it, it seems to be a challenge in some places. I mean, there's some places that get it, um, they do a good job with it. I'm assuming these are, these are probably not the ones that necessarily would call you, right? Because you're kind of like a, a doctor. People people will come to see you when you're when you're sick or they, they need some help. Um, what what's the big barrier in your mind? What what is the what is the thing? 
I mean, you gave us the one big idea, but and maybe you mentioned it during your talk, and I just kind of went over my head. But what is it that people who make decisions about, not necessarily, I mean, they're thinking they're spending extra money or whatever it may be, but who make mm -hmm. decisions about this, what are they missing in a lot of cases that, that, that you want them to know? You know, um, accessibility is not expensive. Building accessibility into a product from the beginning does not cost any more uh, just because you're doing it that way. What is expensive is remediation afterwards. If you're going in to clean something mm -hmm. up, that is incredibly disruptive to any sort of digital organization because whatever priorities your team has had, you can mm -hmm. kick them out for at least a quarter because we're all going to have to deal with this. And that is very expensive and very disruptive to any organization to have to go back, remediate code, um, because the fix is always significantly more complex than it would have been doing mm -hmm. it the right way. And now you've got right. debt to pay off <laughs> yeah. uh, and yeah. just code debt um, that nobody wants. Uh, so it's it's the best for, for teams, for the organization, and just for efficiency. Talk, talk to me about, uh, I'm assuming, and I'm not an expert on this, and I'm assuming most people aren't, that, that there are probably laws and regulations around accessibility. Um, what are they and where do companies get in trouble? Because I, I think I understand, I know what the answer is going to be is that they're not building it in. But um, why is it that, that companies would get in trouble with, with something that could be so costly to them? And, and what are the things that could be, from a regulatory standpoint, costly for them? Yeah. So essentially in the United States, it varies by country, but in the United States, uh, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that was passed in 1990. Um, the idea of accessibility is still a relatively new idea in American society. Um, mm -hmm. But we tend to think of the ADA as only focused on building structures. So like, oh, well, you have to have a wheelchair ramp or the, the doors have to be so wide and the aisles in the, in the uh, retail space have to be so wide to accommodate someone. But uh, through case law, it has now been established that the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to digital spaces just the same way it does in physical spaces. And mm -hmm. generally speaking, that has come down to uh, abiding by the web content accessibility guidelines. ADA complaints are very expensive, um, especially mm -hmm. if they're illegal a complaint, um, not just in terms of what you're going to spend in attorneys and court fees, there can be damages that are requested uh, for violating the ADA. Um, and so uh, having the, the, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act cover this now um, is essentially the, the most widespread part of it. There are also certain mm -hmm. enterprises that are governed uh, or that are regulated by the government. So anything uh, that is regulated by the FCC, anything that's regulated by the CFPB, uh, many different government uh, uh, compliance orgs require accessibility uh, as an additional layer. And that's another enforcement agency on top of just someone who wants to sue you for damages. Uh, so there is quite a bit of, uh, of structure and uh, um, regulation in this space now. So, so we have both the carrot and the stick. So sometimes it seems a little bit odd that, that people aren't paying as much attention to it. Um, I, I think it's get, easy. I want to get. Yep. I want to get to 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 your feel about numbers, mm -hmm. right? Because the numbers should be a hundred percent, right? All the all, all websites and all things should be, and 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 you you, you know I, I I know there's some things I, I, I that I get a score on accessibility when I look at even my website, which is done in WordPress and is very simple. Mm -hmm. um, how what, what percentage just uh, i'm just curious just a thought because obviously i don't know if you have any numbers maybe there are some numbers what percentage do you think align with these regulations and guidelines out there if we talked about something like websites oh that is actually a question i'm ashamed i don't have the answer to because there are different companies who publish these types of reports the the answer is it's a very slim minority of of websites that are that are reasonably, uh, let alone perfectly compliant. The vast majority of the web mm -hmm. is not accessible uh, to people, mm -hmm. who, especially if they have a motor or a vision disability. 
um, which which is sad. Um, we are in this space where there are more uh, software engineers than there ever have been, but they're they're just not being taught about this, and it's not being emphasized in that way. So the 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 shocking majority of things out there are unfortunately not accessible, um, and that's the the way I try to think of it is not that people have are, are have disabilities. It's that when we build a website that doesn't account for people who are going to use it in that extreme way, we are creating a disability for them. We are essentially disabling people because we didn't think about, oh, someone may use this and not be able to click on their mouse. Someone may need to mm -hmm. use their keyboard for this. Um, so we create barriers um, when we don't uh, put accessibility at the beginnings of our processes. The <clears throat> talk about, um, I've got some folks on here that, that are <clears throat> saying hi in the comments. So <clears throat> I see that John has said she's here, so she's listening. Hey. And I'm sure she's interested in that from, from her work at, uh, in her um, ERG at, at work. Ian is here as well. Um, he's hey. going to be a guest coming up in, in the future. Uh, he is very interested, as a lot of people are interested in AI. It's everywhere. <clears throat> Talk about uh, what you know and trends in AI when it comes to accessibility. Yeah, so there are there is a lot of writing going on right now about how do we make sure that that uh, AI tools don't exclude people, um, but also are also um, more inclusive of the way that they they think and generate content. Um, you know, tools like ChatGPT are pretty neat. Um, I mean, they're, they're not true AI. Like ChatGPT is really a machine learning tool because what it's doing is it's pattern matching and trying to think about like, well, this is probably what comes next. And if all the inputs that ChatGPT consumes are from sources where that, that only consider people without disabilities, its output will also be this is the same kind of thing. Um, there are, I think, some opportunities with machine learning to identify patterns and recognize problematic patterns um, using some of these tools. And um, I have, I, I've known folks, and I've, I've dabbled in this a little bit. Like, you can ask ChatGPT to write you some HTML code and mm -hmm. ask it to make it accessible, and you know, it can do an okay job. But um, the thing with any sort of tool like, like ChatGPT, any sort of machine learning, there will always be a level to it that is like spell check, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a big long document and you run spell check and you're like, I've got no errors, but you know better. You know you need to copy edit this because there are words that can be spelled perfectly but are not the right word for that exact situation or that context. So, right. Um, that's where I see that going. I think it's worth watching. And there are companies that are utilizing that, but it really has to do with like pattern matching. Um, so I think there's some exciting things happening there, but nothing at the end of the day is ever going to replace a really good, thoughtful uh, design experience where someone comes in and says, we're going to think about our payment flow, or we're going to think about our checkout, or we're going to think about uh, this particular piece of our app. And we're going to start by thinking about it for people who have a motor disability or a vision disability. We're going to think mm -hmm. about it from the beginning of, for people with a cognitive disability. Machine learning will never do that for you. Um, yeah. It can only look at what's been done before. Yeah. So I'm looking at time. Um, we didn't get any, we got some comments. I showed one of the comments from, from Ian. Um, I think you might've saw that across the screen. Um, don't have any questions, got about, got about a minute left. Um, we've had these discussions before because we work together and, and, and we're, we're, you know, we're, we're in a lot of agreement on a lot of things. Um, one of the things I wanna ask you about because I think it's big when we're talking about digital accessibility is the tools that we can bring that are relatively easy to bring that can help us. They're not perfect tools, but they can help us to understand where we might have errors and, and things like that. Um, do you have any recommendations for people? They want to get started. They want to, to kind of have static code analysis or something, read their 
code and tell them where there might be problems or where there are problems and, and help them with remediation. Um, what about that? So there are a number of tools that are out there. And, you know, if if you are just a kind of a, a, a loan developer or a, or a designer and you just want to know, like, well, where are we at, technically speaking? Um, you know, there are tons of I shouldn't say tons. There's like four or five good um, Chrome plugins you can get. So Lighthouse is one that is an excellent tool that will show you not just uh, accessibility, but also search and search engine optimization and performance mm -hmm. um, we will very quickly show you at a technical level is this good and it's nice because it gives you an actual like aggregate score mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about like a larger enterprise though and you're saying well we want to incorporate um, uh, something across the board you, you kind of have to stop and you have to look at your infrastructure and say well what can we incorporate at the developer uh, environment our testing environment and our production environment. So we got a uniform data set. But mm -hmm. for just, you know, hey, I, I'm new to this and I want to try something. Uh, Chrome is excellent. Uh, it's probably my favorite overall. Um, and it uses okay. so uh, Lighthouse. Lighthouse, you mentioned, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lighthouse. Google Lighthouse. OK. Lighthouse. OK. Super, Charlie. Um, it's a pleasure. It's great to see you. Uh, I'm glad I got a chance to spend some time with you on this Friday. I, I think that the folks who were with us here live and the folks who will see us in the future will agree. Um, real quick, how do they get a hold of you if they need to get a hold of you? What's the easiest way for folks to get a hold of you? Easiest way to get a hold of me right now is probably just through LinkedIn. Um, but uh, if you want to shoot me an email at charlie at charlie 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 dot com, I'll, I'll be here. Okay. Sounds great, Charlie. Thank you so much for being here. I want to thank the people who joined us live. I want to thank the people who are going to join us in the future because this is always going to be part of LinkedIn uh, and it's going to be accessible to people uh, hopefully for years to come. And I want to encourage the folks who were here to bring friends um, if you find this valuable. And I encourage you, if you find this valuable, join us every Friday noon Pacific for another installment of Relentless Learning. Next week's guest is Dan Moody. And uh, I'm going to present uh, some uh, big idea. He's going to present a big idea. So you get two big ideas in less than an hour. Have a good weekend, everybody. We'll see you. Bye-bye, Charlie.